I think that today in the world, uh, a tremendous amount of our politics actually revolves around these struggles over recognition. So identity politics, you know, what have been the big struggles in American life uh, over the last two generations? The civil rights movement, uh, the, the feminist movement, uh, now the struggle for gay rights and gay marriage, these are all recognition struggles. You know, especially the feminist movement and the gay rights movement were led by middle class people whose economic uh, um, subordination was really not all that, all that great. And in fact, most of these people economically were, were coming from the upper middle classes uh, or from elites of various sorts. But the issue for them was, you know, it may have been money, but it was money as a signifier of dignity. That's the issue in gay marriage right now. Uh, it's, it's not material benefits being passed on to you, you know, uh, your, your offspring and so forth. It is really about the fact that people want uh, their dignity recognized uh, as the equals of others. And I think in the nationalist struggles going on in Ukraine, Crimea, uh, all of these places, again, there is a material component to this, but a lot of those struggles uh, are struggles over recognition and, um, uh, and dignity. And that continues, I think, to shape uh, a lot of our international uh, politics today. And that, you know, is the aspect of the whole Hegelian account of history that then brings up this question of the last man, because Nietzsche, you know, in a sense, reading Hegel, said, well, yes, if you get to the end of history, uh, what happens? You know, because history is all about uh, struggle. It's all about the desire uh, to be recognized as greater. And if you have a society based on the equality of recognition, where everybody gets that equal recognition, but nobody has anything uh, to aspire to, that you've got a just and equal society, it's materially prosperous, it's stable, uh, there are no big fights. Uh, this kind of was like Clinton's America in the 1990s, where we could worry about Monica Lewinsky, you know, as the major uh, issue in human history. Uh, um, you know, that, that's problematic, because in fact, what calls forth the greatest virtues, and in a sense, the greatest, greatest flourishing of human character is precisely the fact that there's injustice in the world, precisely the fact that there are great wars to be fought or great struggles to be uh, undertaken. And if you live in a world at the end of history, uh, you're going to have the last man. You're going to have a man without a chest, uh, meaning you know, somebody with no self-assertiveness who does not struggle, does not uh, demand recognition uh, and the like. And... Uh, I would say, you know, if you look around the world uh, these days, um, a lot of, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, it, it continues to be an issue because I think people want something more than peace and prosperity. You know, this is why they want to climb Mount Everest or this is why, you know, uh, my former students wanted to go, uh, you know, work uh, to fight poverty in the developing world. Uh, you know, they still want worlds to conquer. They still want injustice uh, to correct, and so there's, in a certain sense, a hidden inherent contradiction uh, in the end of history world that if we actually all arrive at peaceful liberal democracy with widespread shared mutual prosperity, uh, you know, our lives are somehow going to be uh, diminished as a result of having uh, successfully uh, arrived there. Uh, so, you know, that uh, I think continues to be uh, an issue that. Um, you know, as I said at the end of the book version of the end of history, uh, is in fact one of the unresolved uh, issues in a uh, is in a modern liberal democracy. All right, so let me now turn to uh, fast forward to 25 years um, uh, later, uh, and uh, how do I regard the world now? So, <laughs> so don't tell me that the world is really different in 2014 than it was in 1989. I know that. Uh, so, you know, we got some real problems right now because uh, I think uh, just this year uh, you've had both uh, Russia and China. So first of all, Russia never uh, developed as in, in the way that, uh, you know, we hoped. In fact, I remember Mike Mandelbaum uh, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, saying that, um, you know, Russians actually seem to be much more European than we had given them credit for. And that, you know, seemed to be plausible uh, back then. But unfortunately, now, if you look at the popular reaction in Russia to the annexation of Crimea, 
uh, you know, they're actually quite different in a lot of their, you know, their preferences and, uh, you know, understanding of, of authority and, and uh, uh, things of that sort. Uh, China, for its part, uh, is, did not uh, reform. Uh, Tiananmen was, as we all know, put down in, in a great deal of blood. They went on to be, unlike Russia, uh, enormously successful in developing a modern uh, high-tech economy, and they're on the move. Uh, so they're now slicing up Asia in little salami slices, uh, um, uh, uh, hoping to stay under uh, the radar. But they uh, also, I think, like the Russians, have a certain, and, and actually in, in, in the Chinese case, I really do think it's a, it's a struggle for recognition. I, you know, they don't care about these stupid coral reefs and, and so forth in, in the South China and East China seas. I mean, I think what they want is they want to be recognized as the number one power in that part of the world. Uh, which was their historic role uh, in, un, in dynastic China. And after having gone through 100 years of humiliation and whatnot, they're back. And they're saying, you know, we're back. And, and Japan, the United States uh, are not recognizing that fact. And I think that's really what, you know, the agenda that's, that's unfolding. So we've got a big geopolitical problem. I agree with Walter Mead, uh, our colleague at the American Interest, who wrote in Foreign Affairs recently that geopolitics uh, is back. Um, but, uh, and, 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 and I would say further that if you look at the performance of a, a lot of democracies around the world, there's also uh, you know, a lot uh, 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 that we could wish for. Uh, so some of it is just democratic backsliding. Uh, Thailand looked like a big success in the 1990s after, after it uh, democratized and survived the uh, East Asian crisis, but increasingly the society has gotten polarized between yellow shirts and red shirts, and finally the military stepped in and took over. Bangladesh, you know, it holds democratic uh, elections, but it's in the thrall of these two enormous clientelistic, uh, highly corrupt uh, uh, political uh, dynasties. Turkey uh, has been backsliding uh, into authoritarian practices under... Uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Erdogan, Nicaragua, you know, Venezuela. I mean, there are a number of countries in Latin America that uh, are clearly either highly corrupt uh, or uh, uh, authoritarian or pay lip service to democracy but uh, do not implement the, um, uh, the essence of it. 